I can, I can call my dudes. I can be outside and say, come on, come She started doing all that. I said, I gotta go. <laughs> I had goats. I had I had goats. 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 Oh, they woke me up. I was taking a nap Sunday afternoon and the echoes came to my door. <clears throat> but they were nice. They just said, look, we put up with it for two years. We just want them off the property. I mean, we don't care if they have goats. Just keep building this. <laughs> Sandra won't build a fence, but she'll drive a $100,000 car. <clears throat>
you know, everything in Monroe from utilities, uh, citizen, citizen engagement tools, to our um, training facility, as well as, you know, just the services that we offer, our specialty shops that we have downtown, our restaurants that we have, our parks and recreation, and our, you know, events and entertainment. So this is the introduction video. So hopefully uh, with Showcase Monroe, we can also include, you know, our citizens and actually feature citizens in some of the commercials that we have uh, going forward. So without further ado, a rich history, an engaging cultural life, and high-tech capabilities. Welcome to the city of Monroe. Nestled in the Alcove River Basin between the urban sprawl of Atlanta and classic Athens, Monroe offers the best of both worlds. Whether it's the antebellum homes, the small town atmosphere, or the possibilities of our future, we want to showcase Monroe and why our residents love living here. Apologize for the slow video. It looks a lot <laughs> more smooth when we have it on our own devices. Yeah. But this is just a lead into what we're going to be doing. Um, you know, just featuring different segments of our community um, at different spots, and we'll put on social media and on our local access channels. Very good. Thank you. That looks really well so far. Okay, now we'll move into our public comments. If I call your name, if you'll come to the podium, <coughs> state your name, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the council. Uh, Carol Smith. Hi, I thank you all for letting me come tonight. But I have a simple request. I own the house at 928 East Church Street, the house that's been run into twice. This time, somebody jumped the entire sidewalk from Hammond Drive and ran through my house, moved it off the foundation by about three to four feet, and went through a double brick wall. We we're very fortunate no one was hurt. Only the furniture was damaged in the house. What I would like, my husband and I would like to petition the city to put up a, some sort of guardrail across the end of that street at the sidewalk, right in front of 928 East Church. As I said, this is the second time it's happened. It gets worse every time. So before somebody gets killed, we would love for the city to do something. I don't know what's feasible to do. Um, I'm sure that you, ladies and gentlemen, could come up with something. And that something would be more feasible than I would probably think about doing. But nevertheless, I want the city protected. I want the people who live in that house protected. We've lost our tenants. They were with us for five years. But it has taken such a long time to get the house finished or repaired that they had to find, find a place to live and they have nowhere to go. So the insurance company is still working on it, but it's a sizable job. It's about $30,000. So, we're, as I said, we're very fortunate. The young man had, a, had three passengers in the car with him. He was not even able to get out of his car because he was wedged into the house. So you, that tells you how far into the house he went and probably how fast he was going. Keith probably knows more about that, the city police, than I do, but I do know that the man was either stoned out of his mind or he was drunk as a skunk, so he could take it any way you saw, but he jumped the entire sidewalk, ran straight into the house. And this is where Hammond and Where Hammond church. dead ends into Church Street, right there at the three-way stop. Yeah. It's a dangerous situation. A lot of people don't even realize, I think, that, there, there are, that it is a three-way stop because a lot of them don't stop. They just keep going. So just whatever the city thinks that they could do or the council would think about, we'd be glad to do whatever you need us to do. We'll meet with you. We'll meet you at the house, whatever. Okay. Thank you. We'll but we thank you for letting us come. Thank you. We'll go ahead and ask Mr. Steele if he could do from the streets department to take a look at it and come up with a recommendation. We'll do it. Uh, Ray Boston. State your name, address, and you have uh, three minutes, please. Okay. 
I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. My name is Ray Boswick. My wife and I are, re are relocating from New Jersey to uh, Monroe. Our, our future address will be at 7 1750 Old Athens Highway in uh, Monroe. Our issue is uh, how the water rate is structured uh, at the Monroe Utilities. On, on January the 8th, 2015, we paid $3,750 to set a water meter. And in addition, we have paid an addition $726.25 on monthly fees uh, through uh, this month, a total of $4,476.25. And as of today, we have not used one drop of water. And we, uh, the fees, to the, set the meter and the base rate for the non-use of water, we feel that it appear to be excessive. And we are requesting a rationale as well as the justification behind this uh, structure. And we are asking for some reimbursement on, on, on these expenditures. And because we are concerned about how our future water bill is gonna look when we start using water. Thank you. Kimberly Mayfield. Good evening. Thank you for letting me take your time. My name is Kimberly Mayfield, and my business is at 410 East Church Street. Um, I'm one of the owners of Sparrow Hill Inn on Church Street. We came to Monroe in 2013, and we were immediately impressed with the redevelopment potential of our property, but there was no way possible we could have taken on the challenges of this project without the development incentives offered through the DDA. The long and complex process, process of acquiring a bank-owned property, managing construction on a property in a historic district, completing the process for a change in use and the required changes in zoning made this task nearly impossible based on the associated risk. However, the development assistance, including low interest rate loans, made it possible for us to take an abandoned property and create a viable business, which is much needed for this community. While we have seen a lot of positive change in the three years since we first came to Monroe, we know there's still so much promise, but a lot of work to do. There are blighted and abandoned properties in close proximity to Sparrow Hill, actually right behind and across the street, um, all in desperate need of new investment, and we firmly believe that assistance from the city is critical to seeing the appropriate changes take place. As an aside, we routinely are asked a myriad of questions regarding our property and its history, as you can well imagine. <coughs> Unfortunately, whether it's from midweek business travelers um, and or concerned parents of a bride on a weekend with her bridal party, one of the most frequently asked questions of us is, is it safe? We don't like to be asked that question. <laughs> My husband and I are currently searching for housing in the city of Monroe. Close to the end, we're now empty nesters, so we want to move here. Um, we'd love to be a part of some new development in the city of Monroe, but we'd like to see the support there as well so we know that we're investing properly. While we are very excited about what we have accomplished in this brief time, we also know that there are still plenty of potential areas for the growth and redevelopment of Monroe, but we want to make sure that you understand that we thank you very, very much um, for your past support in helping us get Sparrow Hill Inn launched, and thank you for continued support as we all seek to find ways to help this community grow in an even better, more vibrant Monroe. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your input. And we appreciate Sparrow Hill and also. Thank you. Daniel South. <clears throat> hey guys, I'm, uh, I'm Daniel South. Apologize for my appearance. This is my first city council meeting and uh, didn't really dress up for the thing. Um, wanted to just speak a word of encouragement over the council. Um, I'm a, a uh, business owner in the city. Um, I own a property on South Madison. And kids attend the public schools. And my wife and I love the city of Monroe. Um, and we want you to know that there are a lot of people that want to see downtown revitalized. And I applaud the efforts. Um, that have that have happened recently and the vision moving forward um, but I want to just say like I want to keep seeing uh, progress made and anything that the City Council can pass or approve to show potential investors um, that uh, this is the place to be would be greatly appreciated so thanks Thank you. 
Mark Hayes. Good evening, y'all. Um, I'm Mark Hayes. I'm uh, currently finishing a house about a good driver away. Depends on how good you are at golf. Right here on Walton Street, 204. Um, anyway, so I'm actually here in support of Brian and Sadie Krawczyk's development plan on Davis Street they're currently working on. And basically just to, as Daniel also said, just to reiterate that there is a group of people that want to see the city do better and better things as we are doing now. But um, the more you know, easier it is to be for investors or people that want to flip a house or there's sort of a fear that I think that some people have to actually like she was saying with Sparrow End is certain areas look certain ways and if there we can get bridge that gap <clears throat> excuse me to um, let that fear go there is a group of people here that would love to see that happen and um, I'm definitely one of them so I just want to say keep up the good work and I'm really excited to live in the city of Monroe. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Dexter Parks. Greetings. How you doing? Oh. Great. Well, ironically, I stand before you as an example of um, these great people whom I don't know. You, ma'am, <laughs> or Mark, my first time meeting him, as an example of uh, a resident, a homeowner, a new one, <laughs> a proud debtor in Monroe on the corner of um, Davis Street in South Madison, where my house has been rehabilitated by a group of five men. One guy, I could really put my finger on his cow. He took me under his wing and believed in my story or my trials or helped me out. But I'm just saying now, to that point, I'm starting to notice the eyesores, like right behind me, right beside me. As a business, I live right by a business and across from a business. The one antique place, he's been improving this place and it's some eyesores going down on David Street that I just think it should be addressed. If someone like me could come in and make a difference, I would like to be a part of it. And I need you guys' help. Thank you. Now we're moving to a public hearing. Uh, we have a rezone at 319 McDaniel Street. Patrick. <coughs> Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, we have before us tonight petition number 16-00307 from the McDaniel Titchener House Incorporated. Um, the applicant is uh, requesting a partial rezone of the property located at 319 McDaniel Street. Um, the total request of the rezone is 2.9 acres of the property to be rezoned from R1 to B1. <coughs> B1 being the transitional business zoning between residential and full commercial. Uh, the property has 532.22 feet of road frontage on McDaniel Street, 214.8 um, of road frontage on Woodland Road. The property is in the historic district and being used as a special events center. The code department and the planning and zoning commission recommend approval of this rezone. And um, just to read the required reading here, I'll go through that. Um, the requested rezoning uh, will permit a use that is suitable in view of the use and development of adjacent and nearby property. The change of zoning will not adversely affect the existing and adjacent property. The subject property does have restricted economic use as currently zoned. The change of zoning will not cause an excessive or burdensome use of existing streets, transportation facilities, utilities, or schools. And the future land use plan indicates that property should be low density residential. And as I believe I stated earlier, Code Department and Planning Zoning recommend approval. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. We'll open it up for <coughs> comment now. Is anyone here from 319 Daniel Street to speak in favor of this rezone? Okay. Yes. I'm Connie New. I'm the director. I've been there for 10 years and we're real excited because we're getting a gift to um, start an indoor facility. Um, as you know, the McDaniel's Tishner House is the historic home of Governor McDaniel on 319 McDaniel Street. Uh, we do special events there. 
and we can hold up to 250 guests, but for outdoor. So sometimes when it rains, we have some issues. <laughs> and so in order to protect the house that the governor built, we would like to build a little bit further into the parking area, wooded area, an indoor facility. And that way, if there's rain outs, like our Independence Day concert that's free to the public, we can move it over into the indoor facility. So that is what we're looking forward to do and hoping you will let us do that. Does anyone have any questions? Will the design of the pavilion be complementary to the, the basic design of, of the house and the grounds? Yes, that's what we're we are looking forward to do. Uh, Keith Thompson's going to be the builder. He's here, and John Glefke, who is the grand nephew of the governor, uh, he lives in Colorado. He's very much overseeing this, and also giving the gift money toward this. So he definitely wants to make sure that it's in line with what the house looks like as today. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else in the audience like to speak for this rezone? <coughs> okay, does anyone like to speak against this rezone? Okay, hearing none, we close this part of the public comments and bring it before the council for a motion. May I? going to move approval of this. Uh, this is in my district and I have talked with the people at the house and, and also with the Ms. Kalefke and very excited about what they're doing over there. I personally experienced, my son was married there outdoors. A rainstorm came in just before the wedding. Uh, we had to deal with. So I think this pavilion that they're planning is a tremendous asset to the city and I move approval. Motion by Mr. Brad. Second. Second by Mr. Richardson. Any discussion? Hear none, all in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, <coughs> that passes. Now we'll move into new business. Uh, item one is the second reading of the zoning ordinance code text. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. This is an ordinance to amend the zoning ordinance of the City of Monroe, Georgia. The Mayor of the Council of the City of Monroe, Georgia hereby ordain as follows. The zoning ordinance of the City of Monroe officially adopted June 10, 2014 and effective July 1, 2014 as thereafter amended is hereby amended by implementing the text amendments and changes outlined and identified in particular detail on Exhibit A, which such exhibit is incorporated herein by reference. All ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith are hereby repealed. These text amendments of the zoning, City of Monroe zoning ordinance shall take effect upon their first adoption by the Mayor and City Council. Exhibit A, City of Monroe Zoning Ordinance Text Amendment, Amendment 3, August 9, 2016. Item number one, amendments to section 1000.9 sub three. Item number two, amendments to section 1250.2. Item number three, amendments to section 630.3, table eight notes. Item number four, article 10, section 10, 1000.6.1 sub A. And item number five, Article 10, Section 1000, Accessory Structures and Uses. This is the ordinance, Mayor. This conducts. Uh, this concludes the second reading of the ordinance. Okay. <coughs> Any questions for Mr. Rosenthal? Okay. We have none. We need to entertain a motion. Move to adopt the amendment. Second motion by Mr. Little. Second. Second. Mr. Redcock. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That passes. Item number two is the second reading of the property taxes, section 90-35, ordinance amendment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is, as you recall from conversations with Mr. Probst, this is an amendment to come in line with the newly updated uh, Georgia law change on uh, property tax collections. This is an ordinance to amend Chapter 90, Article 2 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Monroe, Georgia, to allow the County Tax Commissioner to assess penalty and interest on delinquent taxes and for other purposes. The Mayor and the Council of the City of Monroe hereby ordain as follows. Article 1, Chapter 90, Article 2, Section 90-35 of the Code of Ordinances is hereby amended by deleting said section in its entirety and replacing with the following in lieu there of section 90-35 penalty and interest the city clerk shall assess or authorize the tax commissioner to assess a penalty up to the maximum amount allowable per OCGA 48244 on all taxes unpaid on the date due and shall collect interest thereon up to the maximum amount allowable per OCGA 48-2-44 per month until paid 
Article 2, all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith are hereby repealed. Article 3, this ordinance shall take effect from and after its adoption by the Mayor and the Council of the City of Monroe, Georgia. This constitutes the second reading, Mayor. Thank you. Any questions? Hearing none, we need a motion. Move to adopt the amendment, Mayor. I have a motion by Mr. Adcock. Second. Second. On Mr. Perks, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Uh -huh. Any opposed? That passes. Item number three is the first reading of the animal ordinance amendment. Thank you, Mayor. And if I can speak to this just a minute, the uh, as you know, we have an intergovernmental agreement with Walton County, who handles all of our animal control uh, issues pursuant to that intergovernmental agreement. Uh, there has been some trouble and confusion in enforcement through the years when these animal control officers cross over city lines coming in and out of the city back into the county in that our ordinances are very similar but they weren't the same so about a year ago uh, the county attorney along with the director of the animal control office uh, started meeting with all of the cities in the county uh, including loganville social circle uh, walnut grove asking us to get uniform and so that's what this is so essentially this is the county's ordinance uh, verbatim modified to address relevant city provisions city um, uh, boundaries and city protocol because those animal control ordinances uh, cases come to the city of Monroe municipal court so this is at the request of the county but also in line with and in compliance with the intergovernmental agreement which calls for us to have contemporaneous uh, congruent ordinances which have gotten modified through the past so we are the last city to get this done the others have already gotten it done ours had a couple little extra hiccups in it but we now have this ready for you and i'll conduct the first reading it will take me a little bit and then we'll have second reading next month and ready for adoption this is an ordinance to amend Chapter 10 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Monroe, Georgia, regarding the city's animal control ordinances and for other purposes. The Mayor and the Council of the City of Monroe hereby ordain as follows. Article 1. Chapter 10 of the Code of Ordinances is hereby amended by deleting said chapter in its entirety and replacing it with the following in lieu thereof. See attached Exhibit A for the complete text of Chapter 10. Exhibit A. Chapter 10, Animals. Article 1 in general. Section 10.1, Definitions. Section 10.2, Animal Control Unit. Section 10.3, Duty of Owner to Keep Animals Under Control. Section 10.4, Duty to Keep Animals Under Restraint While on Owner's Property. Section 10.5, Duty to Keep Animals Under Restraint While Off Owner's Property. Section 10.6, Enforcement. Section 10.7, Disposition of Impounded Animals. Section 10.8, Public Nuisance Animal. Section 10.9, Abandoned Animals. Section 10.10, Biting Dogs, Cats, and Exotic Animals, Wildlife, and Rehabilitated Wildlife Kept as Pets. Section 10.11, The Establishment of Infected Area Quarantine. Section 10.12, Confinement Area Facility. Section 10.13, Vaccination of Dogs and Cats. Section 10.14, Certificate of Vaccination. Section 1015, vaccination tags and collars. Section 1016, adoption. Section 1017, discretion. Section 1018, interference with an animal control officer. Section 1019, humane treatment of animals. Section 1020, liability of the city of Monroe, officers, employees. Section 1021, violations. <coughs> Section 1022 through 1050, reserved. Article 2, dangerous dog. Section 1051, definitions. Section 1052, exceptions to definitions. Section 1053, applicability of provisions. Section 1054, animal control officer. Section 1055, liability of the city. Section 1056, procedures for classifying vicious dogs and dangerous dogs, notice and hearing. Section 1057, requirements for possessing a classified dog. Section 1058, unlawful acts by owner of a classified dog. Section 1059, confiscation of classified dogs for noncompliance. Section 1060, violation of penalties. Article 2, the all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith are hereby repealed. Article 3, this ordinance shall take effect from and after its adoption by the mayor and the council of the city of Monroe, Georgia. This constitutes the first reading, Mayor. I'll take that. Yes, of course, not the first reading. Yes. I know that our ordinances regarding like dog tethering and stuff is different from the counties. Does this affect any of that? This mimics the county ordinance. It does not have any different provisions. It only is the county ordinance 
as drafted. But currently, Iowa is more strict than the county. That is correct. So this is going to make ours more lenient? This is going to make ours where the animal control officers will enforce it. What the clear message from the animal control director was <coughs> that they would enforce the ordinances as adopted by the county and replicated by us, and that if we wanted to enforce more stringent ordinances, that we could. And, and at I the end of the day, we don't have animal we control. We have been doing some of that, haven't we, Patrick? Yes. We've been enforcing it ourselves, huh? Right? Well, yeah, we've been doing with the city marshal asking them to you know, not tether inhumanely or anything like that. This covers that as well. Um, it just basically allows for monitored tethering. It's on, not correct. So we, can, so we can still do. We can add these on. We can add on additional tethering ordinances layered on. That's the reserve section, 1022 to 1050, if we want to have more stringent guidelines. But the message was very clear that under their IGA, they're only going to enforce their base level of ordinances. And if there's any additional enforcement for different rules, then it would we would have to authorize, we would have to have city personnel enforce those ordinances. I just remember the time we adopted that, we had some people that spoke very passionately on that subject and that they've been disappointed in the county for not mimicking what we had done earlier. So I, that's the reason I asked the question. I understand. And I think the issue is is that they're just cleaning up all the books and saying, this is all we're going to enforce. So we would have but to... unless we add that, this is going to lessen our posture. I can let the code officer speak to it. It's my understanding that we did have different tethering guidelines that were considered more stringent, but there are clear tethering provisions and restrictions within this uniform ordinance. But there were, our, our prior tethering ordinance was considered to be more stringent, if you will, yes. But if we wanted to come back and add that. We always can. And then code office and the city marshal could enforce that only since they're going to the city of Monroe only anyway. Absolutely. It's just so us making that decision knowing that we're not going to be able to rely on the county animal control officers to enforce those more stringent provisions. Okay. And so we, certainly can, we, we, can we certainly can layer it on top of it. You all just need to know that you're going to have to um, task that to city employees and it won't be able to be tasked to the animal control officers. Okay. We just don't my, the, the tethering ordinance was something we copied, y'all copied from Athens, and it's, it, it's been helpful to us, and it needs to be something that uh, police, that we do the citations on or whatever, I feel like we need to stay with those that, that, that y'all voted on and approved, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's also helped our officer safety at, at times. We'll be happy to circle up with the chief and with code officer to look at after we get this uniform one in place coming back and adding additional those ordinances layered on top for us to enforce but they ask that we provide notice if they're going to if we're going to add those provisions um, so that they know that sort of line of separation so we would want to sit down with the animal control director and, and and hash all that out before we passed it but we can certainly layer it back up so the second reading of this will be next month that's correct yeah you know, would it be possible to have a first reading on this edition it would at the same time certainly as long as we're able to meet with everybody and make sure everybody's on the same page so it probably would need to be the chief code officer the animal control folks from the county and we'll be happy to make sure that happens Gag supply contract. Um, Mayor, I'll be happy to take this, but I'm sure Mr. Middlebrook's already gone over it. This is to update our MGAG supply contract. This is a resolution that will authorize the mayor to enter into the new contract, which needs to be back to MGAG, I believe, next week. This is a resolution of the City of Monroe, Georgia, approving the amended and restated gas supply contract between the City of Monroe, Georgia and the Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia and authorizing the execution, delivery, and performance of the amended and restated gas supply contract and for other purposes. And whereas the 1987 session of the General Assembly of the State of Georgia adopted the Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia Act 
as amended, creating the Municipal Gas Authority of Georgia, providing for its organization and purposes, and authorizing it to contract with certain municipalities and other political subdivisions for the provision of an adequate and dependable wholesale supply of gas to meet the needs of the gas distribution systems of such political subdivisions. And whereas the City of Monroe, Georgia, has hereto for entered into a certain gas supply contract as amended with the gas authority, providing for the gas authority's obligation to furnish the member with its gas supply requirements and for the member's obligation to pay for such gas supplies. And whereas the gas authority functions as a government, governmental joint agency operating on a nonprofit basis solely for the benefit of its members and effectively as an extension and instrumentality of its members, aggregating their natural gas supply, management, and transportation needs for economies of scale and leveraging their human and financial resources for efficiency, resulting in lower costs and higher benefits to the members than if they each acted individually or in smaller groups. And whereas the members control the gas authority and its policies through the board of the gas authority, which is composed of member representatives and through the gas supply contracts, including the here and after defined amended contract, and the members intend to collectively share allocable portions of all risks and rewards of the gas authority's operations pursuant to such contracts, and the amended contract will necessarily be relied upon by other members due, among other things, to the interrelated nature of the gas supply contracts and the relationships among the gas authority and the members affected thereby. And whereas the gas authority has presented and the members have commented on, discussed, and studied and reviewed their opportunity to enter into an amended and restated gas supply contract, amending and restating the gas supply contract. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the governing body of the member in a meeting duly assembled, it is hereby resolved by authority thereof. Section 1. The member of the City of Monroe hereby finds and determines that it is in the best interest to contract with the Gas Authority pursuant to OCGA 46499 and the terms of the amended contract, and the member hereby declares in accordance with the Act its intention to so contract with the Gas Authority for the purpose of its gas supply. Section 2. The member hereby approves and authorizes the execution and delivery of the amended contract in substantially the form of the draft of the amended contract attached to this resolution as Exhibit A, and hereby incorporates herein by reference, subject to such changes, additions, and deletions made in the mayor's discretion with advice of counsel. The amended contract shall be executed by the mayor, attested by the clerk, and shall have the member's seal affixed thereto, and shall be delivered to the gas authority, and when so executed and delivered, shall be binding upon the member in accordance with its terms. Execution of the amended contract as authorized herein shall be conclusive evidence of the member's approval thereof. Section 3. The mayor is hereby authorized to execute and deliver all such additional agreements, certificates, documents, and other instruments reasonably required or desirable to complete the transaction's contemplated by the amended contract, including but not limited to any necessary actions respecting the validation of the amended contract through the bond validation process. Section 4, in the adoption of this resolution, the member hereby recognizes that this action will be relied upon by other municipalities that own and operate gas distribution systems and that adopt similar resolutions in furtherance of the organization of the gas authority under the Act, and that the member is also relying upon the adoption of such resolutions by such other municipalities. Section 5, all resolutions or parts of resolutions in conflict herewith are here by repealed. That constitutes the resolution there. Okay. Any questions? Or Rodney. You got anything to add, Rodney? No. Okay. Maybe I'm not motion. Or is, is this does this require a motion? It does. It needs a motion. All right. Need a motion. Move to adopt the resolution, Mayor. I have a motion by Mr. Adcock. Second. Second by Mr. Little. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. Item number five is discussion of the Millage Avenue project. I hear you have some pretty good news, and I'll let Mr. Raven. Yes, sir, from here. I've, I've, I think I've called everybody to, to brief them on our work since the last uh, council meeting, wherein we were discussing the Madison uh, Davis project on Millage Avenue, and uh, that's an urban renewal infill. Uh, project we're struggling with uh, what some of our ordinances meant and did we have the flexibility to assist and help. Uh, I have found out since that time, and I'm, I'm being honest to, to myself and some of the staff too, I think, that we do have an urban renewal policy that was adopted by the council some years back that will provide us guidance in future projects like this and allow us, not require us, but allow us to provide incentive and assistance if we, if we choose to. Uh, and we'll have to make sure that as we apply those and future projects come along that they don't conflict with some of our utility ordinances so there may be some cleanup to do. But the good news is that the 80% of that work then is done instead of having the right policy we've already got a pretty good one. Uh, and then tying back to this though, we did not have to use that policy on this particular development which consists of six uh, units on Millage Avenue. Met with uh, a developer and the developer's representative and, and uh, my staff 
uh, on Friday and we looked at the cost of this and found out ways to actually run the water and sewer lines, change some of the uh, uh, size of the water line from like a six inch line to a two inch line, pulled in the fire chief uh, and planning everybody and to look at this, we, we don't have any water pressure uh, needs that need to be upgraded. We have proper distances for fighting fire. We can get the uh, fire apparatus in on Village Avenue, even though it's not really an avenue, it's kind of an alley and it's paved, but 15, 16 feet wide. Uh, the fire, uh, Deputy Fire Chief confirmed that you can get the unit in there to fight it. Uh, so we look at water pressure and ordinances and all those issues. And being able to reduce that water line from six down to two, uh, the developer feels like that, that they can meet, comply with the spirit, the letter, every letter of our ordinances, and them run their own sewer line, their own water line, through their own property, and not ask the city for a dime, and, and also be prepared to pay for the, uh, for the cost of our cap fees and those kinds of things. So all the things that we require. So there's no exception that we have to make for this developer. This developer's being treated like all our other developments. And so it's good news. It saved uh, them some money, which is a big part of the problem. And so I think we had a good partnership and working relationship straight up with the developer and the owner and had a good meeting. So it's a good story um, to, to come out in a, in a development that maybe will have a precedent so we can get some future belt like this downtown. And uh, so it's, it's a good news story. It doesn't require any action by the council, but it's a good, good report back to you that's all going to proceed uh, as is without any problems. Very good. Can we, yes, you can. I'd just like to ask the developers if, how they feel about the way it's come down to this point. And sure. <laughs> Thank you all for letting me speak. My name is Kyle Harrison. Uh, I do live in Monroe. I am uh, assisting Brian and Sadie. Um, my role is a, I own a contracting firm. We specialize more in commercial contracting in the metro Atlanta areas. <laughs> but I deal with developers uh, quite a bit, and I've brought one into the picture here in Monroe. What this has allowed, Ron and Rodney did a great job of helping us try to overcome some obstacles financially. Um, the biggest item that developers are going to have in town, because I've run the numbers uh, multiple, multiple times, is one, we're coming out of a, a, a low housing market where values are not meeting <coughs> what the cost of construction is. And as Nathan mentioned last week, uh, it is very risky in a situation where you've heard people in the communities that they're getting asked, is it safe? Well, we're about to invest several hundred thousands of dollars, even up toward over a million by the time 20 homes get developed. And that's going to be the first thing that these homeowners are going to ask, is your development safe? And so overcoming those obstacles financially, it's suppressing um, a little bit of what the value of the homes could be. And so anytime the city, and I commend Rodney, I really do thank Ron for looking at opportunities to assist in that because it's going to be a, a difficult hurdle to get over in inner city urban development. Um, kind of as a side note, um, my developer and my friend uh, that is looking at working with us, we've actually looked at the cotton gin. And I've sat in the office of Magnolia State Bank and asked them what they would take for it. We looked at purchasing it. We looked at the building that's there. Uh, we looked at the vacant lot that unfortunately was a fertilizer and has some environmental. We looked at the cotton gin building itself and I've run numbers on a number of things. I've heard the development of a hotel is, is needed for Monroe. We, we priced it. I've looked at condos for rental or for sale in that building and we priced it. And the, the problem that we're running into is the value that people put on the, the land and the buildings does not meet the construction and the development costs. So the city um, working like they just did was very advantageous to us. We are going to, uh, my developer friend was out of town. We are going to sit down next week and assess our final cost and hopefully we can move forward. Um, I will tell you looking at 20 new homes uh, with development fees and with tap fees, 
when you start putting 20 homes at 3750 I think is the number is a substantial investment um, is some things I'd like to also as a side note let you know that my developer friend I know you all know of Mary Felker's um, development and its ideas they are meeting together Monday and beginning to discuss some things and and I know we're all excited about that but the the bottom line is it's it's not a slam dunk from the development side and so anything that the city can do, we appreciate and applaud your efforts because it has helped us on this one. And uh, I just, you know, if you have any questions about it or from the developer side, um, we hope to be able to move forward here in the next few months, start clearing some land and pulling permits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for your help with that too. You bet. Thank you very much. Okay, item number six, Ron, underwriting service. I'll take that. Uh, I've been speaking with you in the past few months about uh, refunding some of our uh, bonds we have outstanding 2003, 2006, and uh, potentially rolling in a, the GFA loan into this refunding scenario. Uh, what we've done is put out an RFQ for uh, bond underwriting services. Um, we did this back in August. We had three really good responses. Uh, which is always what you want to see in a highly competitive marketplace out there. Um, and what we've done, staff has evaluated these RFQs uh, to find the best fit for um, our uh, individual offerings. And also, we did look at price, but you know, price is it's up and down every day with the bond market. So that was kind of a secondary consideration. Um, overall, they were all very close in price, so we, we kind of looked at the whole nature of the deal. Um, and what we're recommending is a group called Stiefel. Um, some of you may have worked with them in the past. Uh, I have um, on several other issues. So um, I, I feel they're going to be the right fit for us. Um, under some of the scenarios, we may achieve a total of $2,044,000 in savings over the next 18 years. That's pretty substantial savings. A lot of that um, will come in the first 10 years or so. Um, we, we've kept the bond amortization basically the same. So we're not front loading it, we're not back loading it. We're just kind of keeping everything steady, just saving money in the uh, raw interest rates over the next several years. Um, so you're talking about over $100,000 a year savings over the next several years. Um, so, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to take that. This is a pretty complex undertaking. I don't ever look forward to doing these, but um, it saves a substantial amount of money, and I think it's something we can pass up at this point. Just to be further further clarified, mm -hmm. uh, this we are not asking the council through this issue if you allow it to extend the term of any debt. The debt payoff will remain the same without trying to extend it push our debt out further to, to make linear payments by financing the house another 10 years. We're not doing any of that. Any of that. So it's a win-win. We had a uh, four staff members. I, I worked on it, uh, Logan and uh, Chris Bailey and then Logan's deputy. So we had four people worked on it several weeks. And we think it's pretty solid. The Steeple <coughs> group, you may also know them as merchant capital. They combine with the Steeple. Steeple keeps the main name. They still have a subset of a name, merchant capital, too. So. Some of you may be more familiar with that. Support everything Logan says. Yeah, just one other thing. In addition, we, we had to price out uh, the general obligation bond that we have. We only have three years left on those. I wasn't totally sure that that would be advantageous right now, but as we move through this process, that may be something we include as a private placement deal, which would cost us a whole lot less to do staff time and to pay them as well. So I'm, I'm keeping that option open as we move through the process. If it becomes advantageous in addition to the revenue bonds and deeper line. Any more questions? Yeah, I had talked to Ms. Rogan this afternoon and I just I asked this question, but just to clarify it, since it's possible we may have to incur some significant cost for some infrastructure over the next couple of years, the next few years, I just rest assured that nothing we're doing here would interfere with our ability to issue new bonds in the future to cover some additional costs. Yes, sir, that's correct. This won't take away from any of our debt capacity or percentages or anything that we are allowed to, to encumber. So this won't have any effect uh, on, on that at all. And 
a future infrastructure like that we're looking at very possibly so sort of like take its own engineering report study and so forth and be a separate freestanding thing anyway so we wouldn't want to add it on to this you wouldn't have enough information to do it but we have plenty of bond debt capacity still this won't harm it in any way anything else we are looking for action to proceed to report Steve. okay not one time kind of motion